Hi, this is Jim from Trek World, and today we're going to take a look at the most amazing discovery to occur in Star Trek fandom, a single prop that was believed to have been lost since the mid-1970s. So if you are a Gen 1 Star Trek fan, then this past week something happened that you never believed in a million years could actually have occurred. Now, the three-foot model of the Starship Enterprise was built by Richard Dayton all the way back in 1964. It was built before the 11-foot model. And it was delivered on December, December 29th, I think it was, to uh, the Howard Anderson Company. And they went and they actually showed it to Gene Rodberry. And we have photographs that you will see in a few minutes of Rodberry inspecting the model. They decided that the 11-foot model, which was delivered on the same day, was going to go back and have some modifications made. As a result, they would use the three-foot model for any shots that were necessary in the original pilot gauge. Now, that model got modified several times over the course of Star Trek, the original series. And then, after the series was over, Gene Roddenberry got it, Paramount gave it to him, and he had it mounted on a flexible microphone stand and a wood base, and he kept it on his desk. And we're going to see photographs of that. Sometime during the making of Star Trek Phase 2 and into Star Trek The Motion Picture, Gene lost that model. Now, they looked high and low and could never find it, and it was officially viewed by Gene and by Majel as really, at this point, being stolen property. Somebody has it, and they're not bringing it back, because every time we ask somebody who has it, we get no volunteers. So, we never really expected the model to show up. I mean, let's face it, if he does show up, one, it's incredibly valuable, okay? Two, it's stolen property. So, if you bought it, you probably would have known that it was stolen, and therefore, maybe you wouldn't limit it to only the private collector's markets, which unfortunately happens all the time in artworks and artifacts, not necessarily just Hollywood stuff. But so if you bought it, the odds are you would probably have known that it was stolen. If you inherited it, you could make the story that you didn't know was upstairs in the attic from your great-grandfather or whatever. This just something that fell into your hands when you found it in a state sale. Or it could have come from a storage unit. Now, for those of you who are not familiar here in the United States, we have vast companies that do nothing but rent out these little, I don't know, 10 by 12 foot units with doors on the outside that roll up and down. And you put your storage in them, you pay them so much a month, and they keep your stuff. When you stop paying so much per month, they wait a couple months and then they auction your storage unit off. And whoever wins the auction and buys it has the legal right to everything in that storage unit. Well, this weekend, an auction appeared on eBay and it literally shook the world of Star Trek. Somebody posted a model. They asked for an opening price of $1,000. And they said it was a Richard Dayton model of the Starship Enterprise from Star Trek. That it was very old. Uh, it was, you know, one of a kind. They had no idea exactly how much of a one of a kind it actually was. As you can see from the auction itself, he posted a whole bunch of pictures. And we're going to take close-up looks at those pictures because those pictures quickly told the story of exactly what this model was and where it came from. The seller, Merch Seller 90, only has 845 feedback points right now, so he's fairly new to the platform, or he's been on it for years and moves very little stuff. Well, he posted this and said, hey, I have this available, and I think that it probably is something that you guys might be interested in. So he posted all of these pictures, and my phone, and my email, and my Twitter, and YouTube, and all of the social media network immediately began to quake in the aftermath of this. I was working on editing upstairs. It was probably about 11 or 12 at night when I got my first message saying, Jim, they found the three foot model and it's on eBay. Hot dog. I jump on the internet. I go searching on eBay. Happy, 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 nothing. Happy, 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 nothing. Okay. So either it's a practical joke being played on me, which is not likely because too many people were telling me this or the auction's already been pulled. Now, it could be pulled for a variety of reasons. One, it is against eBay's toss to resell stolen equipment. But in order for eBay to know that it was stolen, it would have had to have been reported, okay? It could have been pulled because there was something in the wording or something that was done that was particularly shaky. What we actually found out through Bill Prouse was that it was Rod Roddenberry who actually had the auction terminated so that he could reach out to the seller and arrange for the return of the model to its rightful owners. So after that, I get on YouTube and I post a small video. I can't find any pictures. 
help me out, guys. You guys were wonderful. Like, I went from having no pictures to having pictures coming out of everywhere. And I am so appreciative of you both because sometimes you guys can do collectively for me what it might take an afternoon or an evening to do. And I was pretty busy just trying to research this. The next morning, I sent an email to Doug Drexler. Surely they had heard about it before I did, especially if the auction had been taken down. But you know what? You're never quite sure. Don't make assumptions because that always gets us in trouble. So I reached out to Doug. Doug immediately, as he always did, he wrote me back and said, yes, they are in contact with the owner right now and that Mike Akuda is involved. Perfect. No problem. I know that Mike's involved. Um, I find out a couple hours later that Rod is involved. And of course, Gary Kerr had been asked to comment and he said, yes, this looks like it's the real deal. And we're going to look at the features that allowed him to make that proclamation even though we hadn't seen it yet. Now, I want to make one thing very clear. We all believe this is the real deal, but we live in a world today where the real deal can be faked. Now, we're going to look at all the evidence that we had just from the photographs to determine how we make the decision that it's real or not. But until that model is actually in the hands of Akuda, Roddenberry, Gary, whoever they hand it to, and they can begin doing a thorough forensic investigation with it, we're not going to know 100% for certain. There have been fraudulent items showing up on auctions before, complete with what appeared to have a flawless provenance of where they came from. So there's still a possibility that we could be disappointed in this. But I really don't think that's going to happen. And of course, that means we're going to leave it to the experts to figure it out. Okay, so I'm going to rotate this and zoom in a little bit so we get a much better shot of the model. And the first thing I have to comment from this photo, which is a beautiful field photo, by the way, folks, is that even the original three-foot model was not immune from the cell sagging. As you can see here, obviously, the nacelles are sagging from their weight. Matter of fact, I see a few places where the, the left nacelle, the port side nacelle, where it joins with its support, actually looks like it's had a little bit of damage and been repaired over the years. So that tells me a little bit of something that we'll talk more about, about where this was before it ended up in the storage unit. Now, as I had mentioned before, on the day that it was brought to Roddenberry to review, we actually have photographs of it. The first one you see in the bottom right-hand corner is Jeffrey Hunter holding it while Gene takes a look at it, which is pretty neat. And the one you see on the left is Richard Dayton holding it while Roddenberry looks at it. That one is in black and white, unfortunately only. Okay, so after it arrived, Desi Lu used it in photographs for publicity pictures all over the place. They put in all sorts of different scenes. The best known of these photos are on the screen that you're looking at right now. I'm gonna call attention to some of them, okay? Bottom left-hand corner, top right-hand center, you're going to see how the model appeared when it was in the TV show after all modifications were done from the pilot to where no man has gone before to actually being in the episodes itself. The spires are completely gone from the nacelle end caps. Everything is rounded off normal the way we expect it. The other photographs that you see at the bottom of the screen, the two of Spock are obviously done right after where no man has gone before. You can still see the spires are reduced, but still on the model. And of course, the black and white shot of Shatner was shot at the same time as the one at the bottom left was. It's just that it also is in black and white, but you can see there are no spires there. Now, a couple of things I want to point out to you. To the best of my knowledge, the shot was never used in anything. Above that is a really interesting shot because this is the last known configuration of the model before it disappeared. Okay, and how do I know that? Well, the biggest giveaway is at the bottom of the secondary hull, you can clearly see the connector that Dayton added to it so that it could connect to a gooseneck stand. That stand is right up here on the top left-hand side. Now, before we go much further, I want to do a quick zoom in on a letter that Gene Roddenberry wrote in 1979 to Jeffrey Katzenberg, then the head of Paramount. And in it, Gene discusses the three-foot model was given by him on loan during either Phase 2 or Star Trek The Motion Picture. He wasn't quite sure of the time frame. He also was not quite sure who asked for it. John Povel picked it up, took it in, got it to the correct person, and then it disappeared. John could not remember which day he took it, who he took it to. Anytime Gene asked Robert Abel, anybody else, Rick Price, nobody had any clue where it was. So this was his way of documenting that it was missing. And look at this final chapter. My problem is simply getting my bottle back. 
It's a fairly expensive piece of model making, but its real value to me is what it represents. No one I've talked to, including John, has been able to offer the slightest idea as to who got it or what happened to it. So now we're going to take a look again on the stand here. We're going to zoom in a little bit to get a better look at the side. And you can see, first off, there's obviously water damage to this thing. I assume the water damage happened while they were in the storage unit. That's not all that unusual in long-term storage. But there's also a lot of stress fractures. The pylon that goes between the secondary L and the saucer looks like it has sustained significant heavy damage at the bottom. Probably implying that maybe at some point it might even have cracked and been pushed over to the side. It's kind of hard to tell at this point. Also notice on the rear of the shuttlecraft bay, the hangar doors are missing. That's important because even though I didn't point it out to you a few moments ago, the hangar doors were known to have been lost when the model appeared in Requiem for Methuselah in the third season. And the photograph that we have of it from showing from the back shows the hangar doors are missing. That's one point right there for verification of the model. Now here, I'm just tightening in a little bit closer to give you an idea of exactly what that damage looked like at the pylon and just how bad the water damage sort of got to the model and the secondary hull in particular. This is a shot looking down on the model, again, showing you in very stark contrast where the damage has been to that pylon. The seller really wanted everybody to understand it is damaged. Let's now gradually take a look at the model as it exists in the photograph. And you can see several things that immediately tie up on that photograph to this particular photograph. In particular, the one that jumps out to me the most is the, the ridge spine that runs from the back of the upper hull down to the impulse engines, as well as the two points on the opposite sides of the saucer, which looked to me like were used at one point as fasteners for suspension. Now we're just going to zoom in and take a look at some of the inside detail of the port nacelle. Not a whole lot to see here, but I did want to show you where we can see where we have a mounting screw. And this might have been one of the two locations that were used on the nacelles for suspension from the ceiling. Could be. I could be wrong too. But obviously the bolt was placed there for something that needed to be attached. Now we're going to take a look where he gave us a nice clean photograph of the underside of the saucer. And this gives us a really, really good close-up look at the decals used for 1701. And what I'm going to do now is we're just going to overlay the same decal set that Richard Dayton has that we got in wide release courtesy of the 11 foot model. And you can clearly see that while the sizes are different, obviously, the fonts are exactly the same. Now, another thing that tends to happen as the Richard Dayton decals get old, the photograph from this decal is actually in pretty good shape. But as they get older and they're not in such good shape, the outer edges of all the characters begin to age yellow, just like it did in the photograph of the three foot model. Now here we're gonna take a close up on yet another thing that allows us to authenticate the model, at least visually for the time being. It gives us a beautiful shot of the front of the sensor dish. And there's a couple of things I wanna point out. If you take a look at the nick that's in the photograph from the auction on the left hand side, follow my lower red arrow over the right hand side, this is the photograph of the Enterprise that I told you they used that had the gooseneck viewer underneath of it. You can see it there at the bottom. You can clearly see that nick in the gold ring behind the sensor dome. Same nick. Notice the clearance of the sensor dome from the secondary hull. It's very, very short. There's a narrow gap. And again, that matches with the item that we're seeing in the auction. Now, I just want to show you the remainder of the photographs he had. So here's an arbitrary view straight down at the top of the secondary hull with the two nacelle pylons being visible, as well as what had originally been the top side of the shuttle bay. Also though, I think what really he's trying to drive attention to in this particular image is the damage where the starboard nacelle attaches to the secondary hull. You can see it in the secondary hull. And remember, I did point out similar damage at the top of the port nacelle where it joins with the pylon from the secondary hull. Now, just another arbitrary shot showing you the rear end of the nacelle on the starboard side and the fact, of course, that it lost its intercooler thing on the side there. And you can also see on this side, again, what appears to be the rigging that they used to suspend this from the ceiling. Now we just simply slide forward a little bit so you can see what the nacelle looked like as you go towards the end caps. And now, you know, the $64,000 question, how big is it? Okay, so we find out that from the back of there, to about the, what, the first of the points on the saucer on the left-hand side. 
is right around what do we see is right around uh, about 24 inches and then we go forward for the remainder and you can see that we go from about 24 from that first spot to just under 33 inches which is exactly the size that we were reporting at i think it even was originally just under as well but there could be some shrinkage of the wig that's causing it to be just under now but 33 is the magic number we always called it the three foot model but we always knew that it was 33 and not 36 inches. Now, several people questioned during the auction, how did he know it was Richard Dayton and not know that it was stolen? Well, this is how he knew it was Richard Dayton. Richard taped his honest to God business card at the bottom of the base. So when the seller found it, he knew it was Richard Dayton. He probably Googled Richard and found out exactly what he did. You know, and then, okay, you know, Petticoat Junction did all railroad stuff. And he did some stuff for Star Trek. He did the 11 foot model. There's probably very little out there that a normal person would find on the three-foot model on the internet. If they knew what they were searching for, you can find it. But if you're just cruising the highways looking for info, the odds are you'd only find information on the 11-foot. Now I want to take another look here. This is a photograph of the model that was in the auction, obviously. On the right-hand side of the page is the, one of the last known photographs we have of the model on its gooseneck on Gene Roddenberry's desk. And you can clearly see that the basis of the model where it screws into the wood, are very, very much almost identical. And the gooseneck itself is definitely close enough to be considered one of the same. Now, the other thing I want to point out is an interesting piece of conspiracy theory. There are several boards out on the internet right now that maintain that the, the locker was registered to a Burton Holmes in Hollywood. Well, Burton Holmes died in 1958. He was actually famous back in 1917. So it's not likely that that Burton Holmes is the Burton Holmes that registered the container, but I haven't seen proof one way or the other. It is just discussion floating around right now. I've seen no documentation just find the name, but I did want to point out something. This is not the first storage container that Mr. Burton Holmes has been attached to. They had discovered things. In 2004, someone got a storage container in one of these auctions that was registered to Burton Holmes and it contained 200 reels of his documentary footage that he had shot in the early 20th century that had long been found lost. Now, this is really kind of interesting because if his name was in fact attached to this unit, which I guess we'll find solid out in the future, there's twice now that people have found things that were presumed to have been lost tied to his name, even though the Enterprise could not possibly have been tied to him when he was alive. But that's a lot of coincidence. And not me personally, I don't believe in coincidence. If the Burton Holmes name is true, then there's a story here, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll see if I can find it.